It's Friday afternoon, April 20th already. Whew. And you're going to the baseball game today? I'm going to Fenway Park. My guest is Julie Zikafus. Is that correct? Zikafus. Thank you. Uh huh. Although that's you, the German pronunciation you just is it? used. Yeah, Fuss. Fuss. Mm -hmm. It means goat's foot. Goat's foot, but you're into birds. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I invited Ann Taylor from Woburn here today, and Ann is a, um, she's been a member of the Audubon Society, and she wrote a book, Watching Birds. She teaches at Salem State College, so I'll have her in later for her book. I haven't talked to her in 10 years. Wonderful. But I wanted her to be here to co-interview. I try to do that. Uh-huh. And then you get to meet other bird authors, you know. Good. And it's fun. But Ann Taylor is a name you should uh, remember. She's just really cool. I will. Um, the book is marvelous. So my question is the cover painting and the illustrations, did you do them all? Yes, I did. Amazing stuff. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now, I interview illustrators, I interview book authors. Rarely do I get one who illustrates their own book. You know, as I think about it, there aren't a lot of people doing this right now in the U.S. And I think it was probably a lot more common in Victorian times. One of my great inspirations was A Country Diary of an Edwardian Lady which was an absolutely beautiful book that came out in the 70s. And I was captivated by her handwritten notations and, and then the paintings. And I thought, I'd like to do something that looks like that. And you did? Edith Holden was the author and, and illustrator, yeah. It's, it's a bit of a lost art, you know, illustrating one's own work. Me, um, it's just too complex. I, I, it's a lot of work because you're writing a book. Yeah. In your painting. But I guess as you're writing, and maybe you're uh, meditating on the creatures. Well, yes. And, you know, I thought that actually I would, uh, I'd write a chapter and I'd illustrate the chapter as I went. But it didn't work out that way because the human brain is a stubborn thing. There's a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere. And when I write, I'm firmly in the left hemisphere. And when I paint and draw, I'm in the right hemisphere. And it can take me a month or so to switch gears. <laughs> It, it, so I wound up writing the entire book and then painting all the illustrations in one go. All in one go, because people, there are a lot of illustrations. We're not talking about five or ten. If I wrote this book <laughs> and I did little pencil creatures, there'd be ten of them. These there, are really nice. There are 320 illustrations actually in the book. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so basically when, when I finish writing, about 30% of my actual work is done. <laughs> And then I get to illustrate the whole thing. Now, why don't you just register an alter ego and have illustrations by um, Harry Zikafus? Why would I do that? I want all the glory. <laughs> well, you can get paid twice. <laughs> no. <So> I, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You know, uh, see, if, if it were me, I would be um, Norman Bates about it. And what, was, what do you call it? I'm, my Psycho? Blues? No, 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 not Psycho. But my Blueheimers is kicked in, so I can't remember uh, what do you call it? schizophrenia. He <laughs> was schizophrenic, Norman Bates, right? Probably, among other things. Right. So if I did the illustration, it would be my schizophrenic side, you know, you know. Well, yeah, I, I think there are two people in me. There's a writer and there's an illustrator, and and they don't get along all that well. The writer can write anywhere, hanging by one toe. The illustrator has to have just the right music. Just the right temperature of tea, you know, just the right light. The, the illustrator is a very fussy person, and the, the writer is a very rough and tumble, let's do this person. So I, I have a tough time, actually, uh, you know, making the two get along. Well, Julie, if you've only got two in you, you're, you know, I've got a baker's dozen, but we won't go there. Um, do your two ever get into conflict? <laughs> Yes, all the time. The writer wants to write all the time, and the, and the illustrator says, but wait a minute, I'm going to have to do pictures for all that. So you slow down. So you're like a TV with two channels, and you just switch the channel. I have to switch the channel, but it's not easy. Let's get the basic stuff out of the way. Where are you from? Well, I'm from Whipple, Ohio. It's in the southeast corner of Ohio, in Appalachian, Ohio, in the beautiful rolling foothills of the Appalachians. Ah. So it's very wooded. It's not flat you know, Columbus, Cleveland, Ohio. It's, it's mountain, it's almost mountainous. And where have your journeys taken you for this book so far? 
Well, a lot of this book I experienced when I was living in Connecticut, oddly enough. Um, I, I lived there for 10 years, and I was, that was where I first got my wildlife rehab permit. So many of these experiences happened there. I then moved to Maryland and did a bit there, and then uh, moved to Ohio. So yeah, it's, it covers a, quite a span of time and quite a span of places, too. Interesting. Your journey with the promotion of the book. Did oh, you, yes. You start in Ohio? Uh, yeah, well, this is, this is my sort of Boston tour. Ah. Yes. And I'm doing a few things around here, some, uh, some media dates and, and, some, and a talk and a walk tomorrow at Drumlin Farm, actually, in, in Lincoln. In, oh, that's beautiful out there. I know. That's beautiful. So a walk and a talk, that's so marvelous. It's the perfect time of year for It you. is perfect, and the weather's smiling on me, and it's just wonderful. So um, during the winter, when you're at Davis Square and you go into the... Um, the bus terminal. The pigeons come in, I think it's so cute, they come in for the warmth, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to be there around the birds. And I'm going to tell you something I do. I don't know. If, well, the store owners should like it because I'll pay them a buck for some bread and I'll go out into the parking lot, stop and shop, and I'll just feed the seagulls. and Because the, they all fun. seem hungry and it's so much fun. I feel like St. Anthony or something. Mm -hmm. St. Anthony was the patron saint animals, right? No, that was St. Francis. St. Francis, thank <clears> you. <throat> See, that's the Blueheimers because I was at the St. Francis Church March 2nd. Lighting the little votives, you know, uh -huh. at the animal church across from the hotel where I uh -huh. stay. I do a radio conference in, in March, and so I was at the St. Francis. Anyway, I feel like St. Francis out there just feeding them, and they're all so obedient. They're so cool. Yeah. You can chuck a piece of bread in the air, and a seagull will catch it in flight. It's amazing. You know, one of the coolest things I ever saw when I was a freshman at Harvard was watching a lady feeding pigeons peanuts on a park bench right there in Harvard Yard. And I saw her again, but, well, actually, then a couple of days later, I saw a bus come in, Mass Ave, and there was a squadron of pigeons flying at the level of one of the windows, following the bus. And I stopped to watch, and she got off with her bags of peanuts, and she sat down on the bench, and all the pigeons landed and ate. They had followed her in from Boston. They knew. They knew friend. which bus she takes. They, f they picked her up down there, and they followed her all the way in. So they've been following her. They, yeah, they probably can pick her face out of a crowd of several thousand without see, any problem at all. What I thought you were going to say was that she was throwing the peanuts out the window. Not at all, not at all. No, they probably watch her come out of her apartment, get on the bus, and follow the bus all the way in. Feeding time. Right. And I've had several similar experiences that I recount in here. I, had a, I started feeding crows when I was living in a deserted beach cottage in Old Lyme, Connecticut. And it didn't take those crows a couple of weeks before they knew my car. And I was in the A&P parking lot about four miles from my house, and a crow cawed. And those, a squadron of crows followed me all the way down the road, it's several miles to my house. When I got out, I gave them something to eat. They picked up on my routine that fast. They knew my car. It was really neat. Angelic protection. Perhaps. They are little angels. Crows are little angels. Anybody who lives around crows will tell you they aren't angels. <laughs> well, <laughs> see, I, I see them differently. They, they have their nature. God bless them. But the fun thing about birds is uh, James Cameron's film Avatar kind of threw it right back in people's faces that you have to be in tune with your environment. Mm -hmm. And our brainwashing, we grow up in a world that's out of tune with the environment. Mm -hmm. And it takes brave people like you. I, I figure your book is, is almost like a hermetic philosophy, getting people back in tune a little. I think it, I think it really functions that way. And, and I have a blog that I've been keeping up since 2005. And the blog is? Uh, Julie Zikafus on Blogspot. If ah. you just Google my name, it pops right up. So juliezikafoos.blogspot.com. That's it. But you just put it in Google and it pops exactly. up. Exactly, yeah. And, and I have, or you can go to my website, juliezikafoos.com. There's a button for the blog there. But at any rate, I have a lot of people tell me that that's their nature fix. And that delights and saddens me, you know, that, that people are so cosseted and, and, and confined and kept away from nature that they actually have to go online to see something natural. You know, but, but I've also had a lot of people tell me that it inspires them to get out and see their own things. So that makes me really happy. And some of our lives get hectic. My day got very hectic because certain things pop up on your computer and it's like all of a sudden you have to put the focus here because it's a very good opportunity. 
Yes. And all of a sudden, and then I'm like, oh, I better get over there because I do not want to be late for Julie Zickafoos. Mm -hmm. But I was on the phone with a politician, and I'm coming in. It's very important stuff. And it's like, you're important, and he's important. It's like, my life is pretty amazing. But you keep it all in check. And you try to admire the trees as you're going by, but our busyness, yes. I'm trying to, my roundabout thing here is that our busyness takes us away from nature. It does, it does. And, you know, sometimes I stop and ask myself, how did life get so crazy for a bird painter? How did that happen? But we all have the ability to, to, to turn in too many directions at once, and I think that the Internet encourages us to do that every second. It is... Um it's, it's a fascinating thing because the whole world is at your fingertips where without the internet, we're here with a microphone, a book, a table. Right. But it's more limited and you can focus, you know. Yes. The Bible says to focus and, um, and uh, simplify, simplify, simplify is what the Bible says. And, and a lot of people make things more complicated. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the birds don't read the computer. That's the beautiful thing, you know. It's, it's like you, I feel this blood pressure drop when I get out in nature and... I was just at Mount Auburn Cemetery again this morning. When I'm in Cambridge and Boston, that's where I go. I just gravitate to that cemetery because it's full of everything I love. They took out the telephones for Mrs. Uh, Eddy, Mary Baker Eddy. There were telephones there, yeah. <laughs> which, you know... I was just at that memorial this morning looking for an American bittern, which is a type of heron that had dropped into the pond last night. And, and it was right there minutes before, and I was a little late for my lunch date at Houghton Mifflin because I was looking for the bittern at <laughs> Mary Baker Eddy. <laughs> Mary ba right near Mary Baker Eddy? No, yeah, she's, she's got a wonderful sort of a Grecian uh, gazebo-type thing of marble there. That's the, it's quite ostentatious, actually. And which wasn't like Mrs. Eddy at all. No, no, but it's a very, very grand thing. It overlooks a pond, and that's where the bittern was hanging out. See, isn't that an interesting connection? That yeah. Bring up her name. Oh, and yeah. Were. Well, Mount Auburn is fascinating because it's connected to so many things. I, I find a new person I'm amazed at every time I go. Uh, my friend Chris Macomber just showed me Harvard Hill, which is where all of Harvard's beloved, you know, well, not all of them, but many beloved professors. William Alfred, my professor of humanities, is buried there. And to stand there and look down at his stone is just a, a very powerful thing. I spoke to Mrs. Eddy this morning. She says she wanted to get on there and yell, I'm not here, but <laughs> <laughs> but she said she couldn't waste her time. <laughs> I hope people can get the beauty of the joke. But, um, and I mean, don't, I, 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 okay. You have something in common with Mrs. Eddy. She was one of the most brilliant writers. Mm. Have you ever read any of her writing? I have not read her writing. You don't have to believe in science and health and key to the scriptures, but I think anyone should uh, open it and just see her rich grasp of the human language, of the English language, the English. Mm -hmm. uh, she I read an inscription actually on her monument this morning that confused me. She said that science exists only to interpret the divine, which kind of was strange to me. I mean, it, was, it seemed to be a little bit of a twisting of language to her purposes. So I, I, I should really look into that a little bit more. She isn't. She's <laughs> basically saying everything in this universe is, um, is very scientific. Mm -hmm. And that spirituality is very scientific. Mm -hmm. And when you understand what, you know, um, and my opinion is if you can't walk on water, don't try being in the 12th grade when you're in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and if you believe Jesus walked on water, then he had to be so advanced. We can't go there. We can't just think, you know, I'm going to walk on water. Until you can walk on water, you're at that advanced level. And she's saying it's very scientific. Mm -hmm. But I love the opening of her book, To Those Leaning on the Sustaining Infinite Today is Big with Blessings. Mm -hmm. She's so rich That's in very language. nice, yes. Uh -huh. And your book is rich in pictures and words. And uh, I think she would appreciate it because she was one of the first... She was one of the first women to get real recognition in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, again, your book is so into nature. Um, so outside of the heron, are there other birds that flock around there that you... Well, it's migration of? time right now, so the warblers are just coming in. I have no idea. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, Mount Auburn Cemetery on a late April or early May morning is insanely wonderful. And if you don't go there with a pair of binoculars, you're really missing the greatest show. Um, see, with this whole strange spring that we've had, early spring, mm -hmm. a little taste of winter in between, and then spring again, 
I wouldn't know about the migration patterns. Do they change? Yeah, actually, I, I've been keeping records of bird migration since the early 80s. And, you know, I, I'll record the date that some bird gets in every spring, and it's quite predictable. And my birds in southern Ohio this spring are running 10 days ahead of average, which is really stunning, actually. It's a, it's a perturbation like I've never seen, but we must remember not to be too caught up in the calendar because the birds move north as the vegetation unfolds and the insect hatch proceeds. So it's, they're right on time as far as they're concerned. So it isn't, um, I don't, um, anything to do with astronomy. The birds don't watch the stars. They, they go around the vegetation and the bugs and... Well, the birds navigate by the stars, but, it, but the stars don't tell them when to go north. Good answer to a good question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I knew there was something to do with the stars. Yes, the bro many of the uh, songbirds that I'm watching are nocturnal migrants. And they migrate at night because their muscles would simply overheat if they tried to fly in the daytime. That's how much energy they're putting out. See, I thought they were astrologers. Well, I thought that's why they were at night. You mean astronomers? No, I thought that those birds were astrologers. That's why they were at night. No, they migrate at night to escape predators. It's my dry humor. It's so dry. Sorry. <laughs> Um, they, they, they migrate at night to escape predators, she forges on, and to, and to uh, keep from overheating. Yes. I mean, if they're going to be guided by the stars, we might, might as well go all the way. Yeah, really. <laughs> Saturn and Scorpio warbler. <laughs> <laughs> um, back to the book. Yeah. Um, I did a little research, but I'm going to ask you point blank. Is this your first, or have you written other books? Letters from Eden was published in 2006, also by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And it was a collection of essays that moved through the year. And it was also heavily illustrated. It was about half the size and scope of this book. Back in the day when I was in radio, we had a show called The Demo That Got the Deal. So we asked musicians who had hit records, you know, what was the demo that got you your deal? Nice, uh-huh. What was the manuscript that got you your first, first publishing deal? Oh, that's easy to say. Um, I've been writing for Birdwatcher's Digest since 1986, and I think my stuff came under notice because I'd been writing for them for so long. So mm. uh, my first book was actually a compilation of essays that I'd done for a subsidiary publication of Birdwatcher's Digest called Backyard Bird News. And I just picked the columns that I liked the best over an eight-year period, and with my husband's help, kind of put them all together and made my first book. So it, 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 was, it was actually not hard to get a publishing deal because my Houghton Mifflin editor, Lisa White, was quite familiar with my writing through the magazine. So she was into this topic already? Oh, yeah. She's the, she's the uh, field guide um, editor as well as all the natural history books editor. And she's been doing that for a long time. Did she, she was aware of the magazines then? Oh, goodness, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, so she's looking for writers that way maybe? Well, noticing writers for yeah. sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Noticing Fascinating. You had that book come out. What was the genesis of this book? Well, this book was just crying to be written because I had several really good stories about birds. Uh, the, the keystone chapter of this book is about raising baby hummingbirds. And I had one summer that was given over to that. And it was a story that I was really anxious to tell, but I didn't want to tell it in the magazine. I wanted to tell it in a book. And I also had a good story about raising chimney swifts, which was another very challenging thing. And so those were the two stories that really made me want to get this book out, uh, because I wanted to tell those stories for the first time in this context. Would you like me to read a little bit from the Hummingbird chapter? You read my mind, because we always ask our guests. That is, what chapter is it? Um, we're going to go, well, the chapters aren't really numbered, so you just have to kind of flip through it. Page 70. Uh, around 66, right in there. Excellent. All right. We're going to have a, a reading right now from Julie Zikapus. I think book, the this Blueberry is called Effect. Life in the Nest. This is about baby hummingbirds. I think about what it must be like to be crammed into a tiny, thick-walled nest with a sibling for three weeks, the space getting tighter and tighter. Hummingbird nests being constructed mainly of plant down and cobwebs stretch considerably as the nestlings grow, but they remain a tight fit. One hummingbird cannot preen without the consent and accommodation of the other. Often a nestling that's trying to preen or scratch itself winds up preening or scratching its nestmate instead. 
I decide, watching the birds barely tolerating each other, that the ferociously independent and irascible temperament of ruby-throated hummingbirds must find its genesis here in 25 days of enforced confinement with an annoying nestmate. And then there's another part here I like. This evening, I sketch the hummingbirds preening and resting. It's such fun to be in the company of four hummingbirds that have no fear of me, that come to probe at the bright flowers on my shirt and poke their bills in its buttons. They're like fairies, fairies that poop constantly. I have to shield my painting from the intermittent warm patter of their droppings. What I can't wipe off, I incorporate into the painting. It occurs to me that hummingbirds would make charming but really lousy house pets. So that's no. what it's like to live around hummingbirds. Are they generally afraid of people? Uh, yes, if they aren't hand raised, of course, yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Have you hand raised any? Th that's what this whole chapter is about, is huh. hand raising for hummingbirds. Oh, so from these tiny are babies. That yes, come. from okay. tiny babies that, that their nests blew down and they were brought to me. And there are some pictures on page 66, if you look, of the hummingbirds in the nest begging for food. So it's not like you got eggs and, and then hatch them. These are, they, they fall right. and they... Right. Generally, the, the birds that come to me are birds that come to me because they've bef some accident has befallen them. And people know you and they... S yes. And, and yes, they and I have state and federal licenses to do this wildlife rehab. Right, because people should know that you just can't pick up a seagull off the street and bring it into your house. Right, right. It's like any other feral animal. Well, seagulls, or gulls, aren't feral, actually. Feral uh, connotes an animal that has been in domestication or captivity and is then reverting to the wild. Thank you for explaining yeah, that. Yeah, a gull is actually a wild bird, yeah. I'm a cat person, so I kind of... Oh, feral. <laughs> you know, thank you. You, you know, that's, that's good. Yeah. I just want to explain to our audience, you know, uh -huh. that you just can't go up and pick right. up birds all the time. No, you can't. You can't. There are actually laws protecting all these birds, and so you have to have the proper permits to even touch them. Even pigeons. No, uh, pigeons are not a protected species. You can oh. do whatever you want with pigeons. Oh, a friend of mine raises them. Sure, sure. Yeah, the lines blur on pigeons because they're kept in dovecotes and they go wild and they're, they're, they're considered actually a feral species because they aren't native to North America. They're native actually to Europe. Now, see, I did not know that. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I could sit and talk to you for hours. Yeah, about all yeah. These you, have a, you have an encyclopedia at your disposal here. <laughs> it, it, it's wonderful. No, and this is, a, this is an important show, and I'm really glad. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you for straightening me out on that. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, this whole book is about wild birds that I've raised and, and helped and, you know, come to know. Now, with my cats and my dog when I was growing up, you bond with them very tightly. Yes. So you bond with these birds. Yes, and that's what the whole thing is. The whole thrust of the book is to help open people's eyes to the emotional and mental landscape of, of songbirds, which are, as a group, regarded as rather dim-witted or powered only by instinct, little automatons, you know? And so through these writings and through showing how these birds relate to me, and often after they're released, come back, you know, years later, and recognize me and interact with me, to, to, to wake people up to the fact that there's just as much going on in a hummingbird's head as there is in a dog's. And that's, what's, that's where it gets really interesting because a lot of people consider birds just little feathered machines. Oh, look, there's a robin out doing its thing. They don't think that the robin might have goals, hopes, dreams, fears, misgivings, you know. So that's the kind of thing I want to get across. Well, I won't belabor this point too much, but I think the food industry doesn't want us to consider what they're issuing as food as personalities. You're absolutely right. Yeah, the food industry does not want us to get to know pigs personally. That's for sure. Because pigs have too much of a brain. Pigs, are, they all do. Cattle are amazing. I mean, if you sit down and visit with a herd of beef cattle and you watch them day after day, as I do, because when I run on our road, there are these cattle out there, the individual personalities just come shining through. It's just amazing. And then the, the dominance hierarchies and their proclivities and their preferences are all very individual. They're very fascinating animals. It's, uh, um, it's something that we have to evaluate more. And I think books like yours help people think. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the thing. When people start thinking and they see in a good way, wow, these aren't just little robots. Right, right. And the most frequent comment I've gotten on the book, which has only been out since March 20th, but I, I sort of collect people's comments. and. 
What I hear the most often is, after reading this book, I'll never look at birds the same way again. And that's a wonderful thing to hear. You want to think that you're changing hearts and minds. Some of my questions might seem out of left field, but they're really not. Have you seen the Matrix movies? Oh, uh, I know that Keanu Reeves wears a big pair of sunglasses. That's about as much as I know about those movies. They're marvelous movies. Are they? Yeah, because the, the directors, the twin, the, not twins, but the two brothers, came out of the comic book world. But they really make you think about computers and the human brain mm -hmm. and the brains of animals. Now, here's the quandary. Gloria Foster, it was her final role. She was a great actress. She did a movie with Bill Cosby was on Broadway. She was replaced by another friend of hers who went, was on Broadway for the third movie. In the second of the Matrix films, she's on a park bench. She's the oracle, and she sees the future, and she bakes cookies. And you know on a computer, if you go on Google and you go into the news, you get a cookie on your computer, right? Okay. Well, the cookies were a trace program. So Keanu Reeves eats a cookie and he doesn't realize she's tracing him. Is that really what it's about? Yeah, so she's following, she's the oracle, and then they want the eyes of the oracle because she's the only program, she's a computer program. Mm -hmm. But at the first movie, you think she's just another human, and then... Oh, and then it becomes clear to you what she actually is. Oh, well, she goes, let's get the obvious stuff out of the way. They were on a park bench, and you'll see where the birds come in. And he goes, you're not human. She goes, it's a little difficult to get more obvious than that. Uh, she says, everything has a reason. Now, the machines were created by the humans, and then the machines overran humanity. This is what it's about. And then the machines started trying to be human. So okay. it's like the data in Star Trek thing, if you've ever seen that. He mm -hmm. wants to be human. Mm -hmm. Created by humans, then he wants to be human. So the machines are wrong. She goes, look, look at those birds. Everyone was a thought before it became a written program. So you're, you're seeing all these creatures, but as the Merovingian says, and he's her bitter enemy, uh, would you like some wine? And Keanu Reeves says no. And he goes, but of course, everything here is for the sake of appearance. It's not really wine, it's a computer program. Hmm. So everything's a program, but the programs are trying to be human. Here we have humans acting like these birds are not, that they're the robots, and they're really not robots. Right. So it, it all comes kind of full circle. And if you don't watch The Matrix, the second Matrix movie, at least watch that little scene with Gloria Foster. It's marvelous acting. Uh -huh. And there's the birds, and then they're, you know. Yeah. Well, I think as in general, people are, are unwilling to give animals other than their beloved pets much credit for intelligence or rational thinking. And, and that it's wonderful to be living in a time when that pendulum is starting to swing, when there have been enough good studies done, like with Irene Pepperberg and her African gray parrot Alex, who learned to categorize items and, and put together sentences and coin new words, you can't deny when these things are done in a controlled laboratory situation that there's a, a superb intelligence at work there. It's a disconnect. <clears throat> People's pets are their pets and their food is their food. It's kind of like if you have an enemy at war, the Russians. We shouldn't be fighting the Russians. And if you bring a friend over and you have friends, and it's like, oh, this is my friend from Russia. Um, and some of the friends hate Russians, but they love your friend from right. Russia. Uh -huh. And then they leave, and it's like, um, you were so nice to him, but you've always talked bad about Russians. Well, it's different. You know him. Yes. yes. There's that disconnect. Yes, there is a great disconnect, yes. It's as if, oh, my dog can do this and such and is so amazing and so brilliant. but. That white-tailed deer is just stupid for running out in front of a car. You know what I mean? It's like they, people just they, just, they stop at wildlife. They don't think about the fact that animal intelligence spans the entire spectrum into the marine fish that we love to eat, into the, you know, and so it's... Uh, I'm quite concerned about the fish. Yeah, there's, there's a lot going on with marine fish. It's quite frightening. It is, and you know what's... what's um, people might not see it this way right now, but I think that the zoos and the... Aquariums are very important because they're protecting these creatures in a way, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, with all the poaching and stuff, I think a creature's better in a zoo. Oh, dear. I Please know. Please never it, say that. Well, because they're being exterminated out there. Yeah, well, we have a way of overfishing, and people don't really get too concerned about it because they're just fish, after all. But, you know, I was just reading about the pet food industry. The cat food industry takes a tremendous amount of... Uh, small bait fish for rendering into pet food. But those are the 
grass of the sea. You know, that's, everybody eats those. So if you wipe out the prey base by taking all the small fish for something like the pet food industry, then what do the larger fish eat and the larger fish after that? So you're basically knocking the legs right out from under the, the food chain by doing that. The other thing they're doing is they're feeding cattle from a protein that's based on fish. Oh. So the overfishing is having a problem with feeding the cattle. Yes. We're feeding, we're feeding animals the wrong things. We've been doing that for a long time. We figured out with the mad cow disease that you don't feed cows cows. You remember that? They're grinding up cattle and the neural tissue was getting in. Yeah, you don't feed cows cows. You feed cows grass. Um, so your book helps ground people. And, and, and I think it's, it's great that you're out on the road. Out in Lincoln, that's just so fun. Oh, I can't wait. It's going to be great. We're going to walk around and check all the bluebird boxes, and we'll, I'll pull some nests out and talk about bluebird development. You can pull a nest out? Yes, absolutely. If they're baffled for predators so that nothing can climb up to the box, you use a stovepipe baffle usually, it's, you're quite safe in handling the nests and the nestlings, and the parents will come right back. They, I know. Whoa. It's the number one frequently asked question that I get. How can you do that? Won't the parents desert? Won't they smell you on their babies? And that's what we're all told from a very young age. And it's a great thing to tell kids, I guess, even though it's a lie. Yeah, because you don't want them touching Because you don't want people messing with baby birds. You don't want people reaching into nests and taking them out. But it's actually uh, doesn't give the birds enough credit for the very strong bonds that they build with their young. And they, a bird is not going to desert its baby just because it saw you pick it up. That is good to know. Back to Cambridge, when you see a bird that you're looking for, it was a heron? Uh, it was a bittern, which bittern. is a type of heron. Okay, I don't know what a bittern is. Well, it's a stripy heron, basically, okay. a short-legged stripy heron. Do you have a camera or a video camera? I do. I have a beautiful Canon 7D and a nice long lens. And so you are a lot of fun capturing. I'm not doing video, but I'm capturing pictures of them. You know, um, do you have public access out where you live in Ohio? Public, this is a public access TV station. Yes, I believe we do. So we're on cable TV. Uh-huh. And they teach us how to use Final Cut Pro or iMovie. There's different editing software. Do you edit your escapades? Well, I don't do a lot of video okay. or anything like that. I, I do still photos, and, and, I, and I have a blog. But I'm, ah. I'm not quite into video as much as a lot of people are. Mostly it's a memory thing for me, eating ah. up all the RAM on my computer. <laughs> oh, because I'm, I'm just thinking, if you have a public access station out there and you're, you're on your tour taking you know, Cambridge, and then link in and you have a little footage, you go into the access station and then you build a montage, a little movie of, you know, Julie's tour. <laughs> I'll stick to blogging. <laughs> it's just I'll stick to I've, painting. <laughs> because then it comes to life like in the, on the YouTube. It is great fun, yes. I have put a few things up on YouTube. I do some kind of unusual things like bat rehabilitation and, and the videos that I make of the bats are, are, are very popular. Bats. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you look at bats, too? Yes, I work with them. Mm -hmm. You work with bats? Uh-huh. Vampire bats? No, vampires aren't native to the U.S., so I'm working with big Pigeons browns. Pigeons aren't either. Big browns. Okay. And what is a big brown bat? It's the, it's the most common species that, that roosts in attics and garages and things like that. It is the bat that chooses to roost near us. And so it's the one that most frequently comes into contact with people and winds up in the wrong place, like in a church basement or something like or that. Or in my kitchen. Yeah, yeah. If you have an old house, sometimes you'll have bats find their way down through the flues and the chimneys and the walls. When we lived in Woburn, um, 1991, 92, <coughs> bat comes in the front door. Mm. Now I'm frightened, but I was very good about getting it out. So it was frightening. Me and my roommate at the time were very frightened, but... It was clinging to like the, the stove, uh -huh. or the white, uh -huh. and then it just, I don't know if I got a broom or what, but I was frightened of the animal mm. and pushed him out very safely and it got Good. out, he or her. Wonderful. And yeah, and it was like exhilarating to get the bat out of the house safely. It is safely. a great feeling, yes, yeah. I usually recommend that people put on gloves and then throw a little bath towel over the bat or a little hand towel and just bundle it up. Oh, wow. See, Wearing I gloves. I'd be afraid to do that. Yeah, a lot of people would be. Frightened that the, I don't know the size of the fangs. I don't know if they're going to go through the glove. They so. actually have a very powerful bite. <laughs> but, but they are, but, you know, if you're going to work with bats, you need to be vaccinated for rabies.
Oh, okay. There are no bats in this book. No, but there will be probably bats in the book after this next one. You know, I think a bat book would be exciting for all the vampire fans out there right now, which there are many, believe it or not. Just because bats and vampires go hand in hand, I think it would be very popular. I'm not sure that the vampire-loving crowd has any interest in bats. I think so. Do you? Yeah. I think that the whole vampire mystique, the bat is central to it. Hmm. And I think that all these vampire-loving teenagers now, because, you know, with Bela Lugosi, I was into it way before these kids, and they should all go back to Bela Lugosi, the, you know. It's wonderful stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it was the first sound horror movie. Mm -hmm. Did you know they made a second Dracula simultaneous with the Bela one? Has it been released? I mean, yes. you can see it? What happened was, it was the first horror talkie. Okay. So, Universal Pictures made a Spanish version, sometimes at night, sometimes a week or late, later, but the Spanish directors would watch Todd Browning's work, then they would do the Spanish version. There's two, so if you get the Dracula on DVD, you can actually get the Spanish and the English. Cool. What I'm hoping is because the Spanish uh, embellished the scenery, seeing what Todd Browning did, and his was succinct and he had to get it out for America, there's longer scenes like Dracula on the stairwell, and I'm thinking just take those scenes and put them in a Bela's version. Sure, there you go. And no one's done it yet. Do a hybrid, yes. Yes, uh -huh. but the two movies, now, I'm a huge Bela Lugosi fan. I have been since a teenager. Why do I only know this in 2011, 2012? Yeah. Why is it taking that long for me to... And I watched the whole Spanish version on YouTube. Cool. So, and this is going to go up on YouTube. Do you mind? Not at all. Yeah, so our, our little chat today mm -hmm. will go up on YouTube. But I think bats, vampires, it's key. I think you will have a niche audience there with the bat book. I well, I, I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't write a book exclusively about bats, but I'm thinking of revisiting Letters from Eden, which was a general natural history essay book, and working bats into that. So if I can ask, and, and we're talking to Julie Zikafus, The Bluebird Effect, Uncommon Bonds with Common Birds. Please Google Julie Zikafus to read her blog. Um, we, we learned that you work with birds and you work with bats. What else here is in your natural history resume? Well, I'm an avid horticulturist. So I, I have a large orchid collection in the house and I have a greenhouse outside that I play with. Wow. And so I try to grow all of the hard to find and strange and rare plants that I adore, but that are very difficult to find in nurseries in Ohio, you know. So I, that's, that's another facet. I, so the gardening actually dovetails beautifully with the birds because I garden for birds. And we've taken our place in the 21 years we've lived there and turned it into an absolute paradise for birds. You say you garden for birds. Yes. So your gardens complement the birds. Yes, well, the gardens feed them. And so I, I plant uh, flowers that the hummingbirds love to feed at. So we have clouds of hummingbirds around our flowers. And then I plant a lot of flowers that when they go to seed, finches and sparrows and juncos like to eat those seeds. So the hummingbirds that come aren't naturally hand raised. Some are just wild. Oh, oh, they're all wild, yes. And do they ever mingle with the Oh, sure. Hand yeah, raised? yeah. The chapter in here talks about the sort of integration of my hand raised I, babies into the into the population. I yeah. didn't get to that. So uh -huh. what happens? Do they move on? Well, yes, they migrated actually, and I'll read the you a little. The hand-raised migrate. Yes, Fascinating. yes. Well, they better migrate. I mean, when I release them, they'd better be functioning wild birds. So let me just uh, read you a little something here. We've got about 17 minutes left. Okay. I released the birds, and they were about 31 days old, and I did not know this, but they were going to hang around for another month and a half wanting to be fed. So that was a lot of work, running around the yard with an eyedropper. But then September came, and everyone I knew who had met these birds asked me the same question. Would they return to Ohio the following spring? Would they migrate? Which would be my natural question. An image of the United States, the Gulf of Mexico, yawning beneath it like a huge mouth would pop into my head and I'd hesitate before answering. Those baby hummingbirds I'd raised would have to fly from southern Ohio to the Gulf Coast. There they'd double their weight before launching themselves on an 18 to 24 hour 500 mile nonstop flight across the Gulf, trying to reach landfall in Mexico. If their wings stopped beating for more than a few seconds, if a storm hit, if a headwind sprang up, they'd fail. 
and there would be glittering green feathers in the flotsam. All I could say was, I sure hope they come back. My three hummingbird orphans left on migration in September 2003, and I spent the winter wondering if they'd made it to Mexico, and the early spring wondering if they'd make it back home. On April 17, 2004, my husband Bill stepped out, coffee mug in hand, to take in the morning sun. A male ruby-throated hummingbird zipped up, hovered in front of his face, then poked his beak in between each pair of Bill's fingers. It was as close to a handshake as a hummingbird could manage. Later that day, I looked out to see two male hummingbirds sitting shoulder to shoulder on a twig by our front door, one that had been their favorite as youngsters. I rummaged around until I found the small feeder they'd used the summer before and filled it with the brown, protein-rich solution the three had been raised on. As I reached to hang it from a branch, three adult male ruby throats wove through my arms and around my head, fighting to be the first to feed. Seven months and two ocean crossings behind them, my hummingbirds were home, right where they belonged. All of them? All three. Wow, that's so touching. It was very neat, and, and one of the reasons that I knew that these were my birds was A, they were completely tame, B, I've never had a, a wild hummingbird poke my fingers. Mommy. Yeah, daddy. C, the hummingbird feeder that I used for them was filled with this mud brown solution that only they recognized as food. Wild hummingbirds won't touch it. So there were, you know, this is, this is the kind of anecdote that's rich throughout this book that I can substantiate not with data, but with evidence. Yeah. Yeah. That is fascinating. It's pretty cool. So up around page 214, you have a beautiful little kitten with a bird in its mouth. Yes. Yeah. Which is why our cats are indoor cats. Good for you. I'm so happy to hear that. Uh, actually, about 90% of the birds that I get in rehab have been injured by cats. And unfortunately, very, very few of those ever make it to be releasable because the cat has a habit. When it first grabs a bird, the first thing it does is bite the shoulder. To stop the wing. To stop the wing from working. They know what they're doing. They know exactly what they're doing. They can have fun with it then because it can sort of fly, but it will never fly again. And there's no amount of surgery or pinning or reconstruction that you can do on a joint so tiny that's been bitten by a cat that will ever make that bird viable in the wild again. And that's why it breaks my heart that people let their cats roam outside and say that it's natural for them to kill birds because it's anything but. And the, the other thing is we live in a nice little rural street on a very busy main street. Uh huh. And we see cats out. Um, you know these Yahoo groups that people in cities, you know, like the, there might be a Winchester Yahoo group. Okay. So in Medford, where I live, the next town over there's a Medford Yahoo group. And a woman lost their bird, their cat. And I hear a cat next door. And I said, I hear a cat in the garage next door. It was the cat. Wow, that's cool. And they, they said, thank you, Joe. I got a little note, you know, thanks for using the Yahoo group. And it, it, it was effective. Wonderful. 55,000 people in Medford, 700 are on the group. Yeah. That's amazing. That's a lot. That's very amazing. But you know, the internet has revolutionized animal rescue. Yes. Really, because you can put a picture up and say, this Boston Terrier is about to be euthanized because it has a bad hip. Anybody want to help? And people do want to help. If they know about it, they want to help. If they know, and um, that's a big thing. We keep our cats in so they don't, they don't go out. There's no car problem and there's no bird problem. Right. But we, we're astounded that people will let their cats out, just for that instance. So if someone it is amazing. walking in in a garage. Yeah, and well, not only that, but I mean, I think the ultimate way to appeal to cat owners is to say it's bad for your cat to be out. Because really, somehow they've rationalized in their mind that it's okay that the cat kills birds. Or they wouldn't let it out. Again, it's an educational thing because I've had cats for years and I would have changed my behavior earlier about letting the cats out. Sure. Because we lived in, more, in Woburn where it was more wooded. Uh-huh. Uh, and now if there's you foxes. Yeah. Sure. And things. Uh, I would have, um, now I have a whole different mindset, but it came from experience. Yes, and, and the persistent efforts of groups like the American Bird Conservancy to enlighten people with their Cats Indoors campaign that, that this is really a serious and huge problem. And we're talking billions of songbirds killed by cats every year. It's, it's not just in the millions. We're not talking tens of thousands either. We're right. Billions. Yes, yes. This is um, incredible data. Yeah, it is amazing. The University of Wisconsin did a wonderful study, Stanley Temple, on how many birds cats kill. And I can't quote it chapter and verse, but it's, it's staggering. It really is. And what are the other predators outside of birds? 
Other uh, birds? Well, other birds, the sharp shinned and Cooper's hawks, which are, the Cooper's hawk is becoming an urban hawk in Ohio and, and all across the eastern seaboard, actually. And they are specialized predators of birds. Which is another reason to keep your cat in from the hawks. Well, a Cooper's hawk wouldn't hurt a cat, but a red tail, I think, could probably do a bit of damage. And we have a lot of red tails in Boston now. You say we. Well, I feel like when I'm here, I feel like I'm back home. Because you know? of Connecticut. Yes. Well, because of being, being here for 10 years. This is a marvelous painting. Thank you. That's an ivory-billed woodpecker. That's the one that people think might be extinct. Oh. And then a lot of people think it still is alive. And that whole chapter is about interviewing the last people to have truly seen it before they died. And it's a, quite, a, quite a moving chapter. And it's just, it, it, you just wish you could flick a switch and people would get their heads on straight that we have to just go out there and stop protecting. I think a lot of people know that. But if we could, if we could take our homeless and give them a job of protecting animals, wouldn't they be, feel more fulfilled? That's pretty cool. How, how, what kind of a job protecting animals? How would you do that? You, you start with the basic. You, you send them to beaches to clean up beaches and say, and, and you know, and take notes on which birds are around. Mm -hmm. Giving them something to do. We spend so much federal money and state money on this, that, and the other thing, which greedy politicians, for expedience purposes, just say, yeah, do that. Yeah, bridges to nowhere, you know? Mm -hmm. Instead of focusing on our humanity and helping our struggling people out, mm -hmm. and giving them something to do to reconstruct the mess we've made. Mm. Starting with the beaches, and the birds on the beaches, mm -hmm. and the other creatures on the beaches, mm -hmm. and then going inland. It's all too logical, Julie, <coughs> you know? And, and I try to, even the craziest questions I might ask you, you can see that at the core there's logic. Yep. Mary Baker Eddy, mm -hmm. The Matrix. Um, logic is where we have to start, and it's, we haven't, it's an illogical world. Why do I have to wait for a book author to tell me about hummingbirds, you know, and, and, and things that really just every human being should be in touch with? Because it's part of our environment? Well, a lot of people aren't fortunate enough to live among these things. And those of us who are fortunate enough to experience that and to be drowning in nature all day, every day, it, it really behooves us to share it as much as possible and let people know how beautiful it all is and how incredible. So which one of your alter egos <laughs> drew that? That's another beautiful picture. It's an osprey with a fish. Wow. Um, how long did it take you to do a painting like that? That's actually quite a large painting. It's a half sheet watercolor, so the actual bird is about this big. So that took me um, probably about 12, 14 hours of work. Not, not as much as you might think. And then how did you get it into the book? How does it go from painting into book? Well, it's uh, scanned digitally, and then with a camera, a uh, scanner actually. Oh, so you put the whole painting. Right, up. right, yeah. You know it's big. Yeah, yeah. You have a big scanner. Well, they'll be flat scanned, the bigger ones. Most of my paintings, though, are no no larger than they appear in the book. They're not much larger. Yeah, so they're digitally scanned and then sized and reproduced that way. The front cover and the back cover are they pretty much? Um, as you've painted them? Uh, yeah, this is, this is reduced somewhat from the size I painted them. And this, this one is reduced a little bit, too. I usually paint about 20% up from the size that it's reproduced. I mean, that's just such a lovely bird. Is that a bird that you painted, that a real bird? Well, that's, that's a depiction of Mr. Troyer, one of the bluebirds who's profiled in this book. He nested in my yard for eight years and raised 64 or 67 young in that amount of time. Pretty crazy. He's a father? He was a father many times over. How many wives did he have? He actually had three in that span. Only three wives and 67 offspring? Well, they're, they're monogamous, so he really could have, if, if the fates had conspired right, he could have had the same mate the whole time. But his mate, one of them got picked off by a sharp-shinned hawk. And so that's eventually, I think, what happened to him as well. Oh, awful. Well, he was old. <laughs> They all go sometime. And if he's old, he's not as, sh as quick? Probably, when yeah. Coming. He had been injured by a hawk, so he had a droopy left wing to start with. So probably had his second and last run in. Oh, that's, but he has 67 offspring out there. Yeah. There are a lot more bluebirds in our area now since we've moved there than there were when we came. So you kind of re 
focus the bluebird population? Well, I, I run 25 boxes, and I check them all once a week. So, yes, yes we, are, we are cranking bluebirds out. In a good year, I can get 90 fledglings out of my boxes in one season. Okay, we have five minutes left. Do you mind if we focus on the boxes a little? Sure, not at all. Um, we have five minutes, so you can go in mm -hmm. any direction you want. Mm -hmm. But you have boxes on your property. Well, and, and on neighboring roads with good bluebird habitat, which is, you know, hayfield, pasture, that kind of thing. Bluebirds really like mown areas, too, so lawns are excellent habitat as long as people don't use lawn chemicals. Ohio, are you, where are you, like, um, geographically when it comes to, like, you know, we're in New England when New England weather is strange, but you know sure. that. Sure, yeah. Ohio, do you get more summer or do you get just equal of what we get here? I'm at about the same latitude as D.C., so, oh, it's a little warm. Yeah, so I'm a couple of weeks ahead of you in leaf development and flowers and birds coming in and stuff like that. So we're in extreme southeast Ohio, right on the West Virginia line. Okay. So, yeah, so it's, it's on the other side of the state from Cincinnati. Okay. Yeah. So you're in more of a, a section which is a little country. Oh, very much so. It's okay. very rural. Yes, I can't see any neighbors from our house. It's nice. It's nice. It yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, humans can upset the ecosystem. Well, you know, it's a writer's retreat, sort of. There you go. That's yes. a nice way of putting it. Humans bother me sometimes. <laughs> but I, I'm a, a full supporter of your book. Are you going to see my friend Kate Genovese? Do you have a, she's another host, hostess. Oh, not that I know of. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I think Kate was trying to fit you in. I don't know. if. Okay, oh, so maybe. Guess, well, you know, this is a continually evolving book tour, so it could could have happened without my knowledge. Oh, okay. She's very nice. You'll love her. Uh -huh. She's a nurse, and she's very sensitive to the same issues. We have a lot of the same likes. She's great. Wonderful. Um, you're doing the New England thing. You're going to be in Lincoln. Where are you going to go from here? I'll head home, and then I head to Columbus, to Erie, Pennsylvania, to Fayetteville, West Virginia, to Carrington, North Dakota, to Hog Island, Maine. So, and it's not just a book tour. This is the typical travels that I do each spring, speaking at bird festivals oh. and leading field trips and things like that. And Maine is lovely. Now, where is that in Maine? Is it high up? Hog Island is uh, near Damariscotta. And it's absolutely beautiful. It's wonderful. Well, there's an Audubon camp there, and we have uh, my husband and I teach a course called Joy of Birding, the last week of June. Nice. So Maine Audubon would be the contact if you wanted to find out more about that. Wow, we have two minutes left. The time just flies, doesn't it? It does. And uh, there'll be birds in Fenway Park looking for the popcorn. Yes, indeed. And I'll have my telephoto lens, but I'll probably be aiming it at some older baseball players who are coming out on the field for the, the celebration today, the 100th anniversary. Oh, so, oh, the older guy. Oh, what time is that going to be? Well, it started at about 2. Oh, my so, apologies. That's all right. It's well worth it to talk to you. You've been visualized on visual radio. My <laughs> guest today, Julie Zikafus, uh, The Bluebird Effect, Uncommon Bonds with Common Birds. Julie, it's just a wonderful book to flip through. Thank I you. I hope, I hope you enjoy reading it. It's great fun. I love that you can go to diff different chapters. You don't have to go from beginning to end. Exactly. Yeah, each chapter stands alone. And that makes it a real pleasure to read if you're just going to read a few pages at night or something like that. It's really... But it's cohesive as a whole as well, but you can just pick up a chapter and read it. Are any of these from articles you've written? Some of them are. The Ivory Build uh, Woodpecker was a major article for Word Watchers Digest. Wow. Um, but most of this is brand new. Um, this is not a compilation, actually. 45 seconds left. The time just flies. I want to make sure you get to Fenway Park Thank you. on time. And, um, you know, the only Orioles we want to crush are the Baltimore <laughs> Orioles. I hope you don't mind because you live near there. <laughs> The O's are fine, but we're Pirates fans. Ah. Huge Pirates fans. Okay. Yeah. Have fun Thank in you. Lincoln this weekend. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you for coming out to Visual Radio. My pleasure. Do you have a pen on you? I do, but over there. Okay. I'm going to ask for an autograph. And uh, thank you, people. I'm going to do the credits on the air. Your publicist's name is? Taryn Roeder. I knew that. Thank you, Taryn. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Wincamp. This is Visual Radio. It's Friday, April 20th, 2012. Thanks for watching.